This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Doppelganger As her eyes begin to close, blood flowing from the massive gash in her head and the wound in her shoulder, she meets your eye and utters her final words. I'm sorry. You have no idea what she's apologizing for. And then her form seems to turn to wax, like a melting candle. It elongates and shrivels. Her facial features melt away, leaving a gaunt, emaciated, purple-skinned humanoid. She was a doppelganger, and she died protecting you. But why? From the Angry DM's Living City campaign, as explained briefly below. The Doppelganger is one of those monsters that has been included in D&D from the very beginning. It first appeared in the Greyhawk supplement by E. Gary Gygax back in 1975 and it has since appeared in every edition of D&D, though it had to wait until the second Monsters Compendium in AD&D 2nd Edition before it got any love. And in basic D&D, its name was misspelled. In D&D, the Doppelganger is a shape-shifting humanoid with limited mind-reading abilities. The doppelganger would kill someone, transform into an exact duplicate of them, and then take over their life. And it would read the minds of friends and family to pull off the trick. In some editions, it would actually eat the brain of the victim and absorb their memories. And different variants, like the greater and dread doppelgangers, appeared in various supplements and settings with different powers of mimicry. But they all do the same thing. And that leads us to the doppelganger. Note the fancy umlaut. Which is a German word that means double walker. While the word is of a fairly recent origin, the idea is a bit older. In various European mythologies, the doppelganger is a ghostly double of a person an identical apparition. According to legend, when someone sees your doppelganger, it's a bad omen. If you see your own doppelganger, you're going to die. And there are famous accounts of doppelganger sightings in history. Abraham Lincoln once reported seeing his doppelganger in the mirror. And you might just assume that the 16th president just didn't know how mirrors work. But he saw a double of himself standing behind him in the mirror. So there were two of him in the mirror, okay? At least, that's what he said. In most doppelganger stories, the doppelganger is just hanging around, doing people things, and acting normally. Most of them are just about people seeing someone they know, and then later discovering the person couldn't possibly have been there, or else discovering the person was dead. But some stories ascribe more sinister acts to the doppelganger. Doppelgangers had been accused of providing malicious advice or corrupting people in the guise of a friend or confidant or even giving bad advice to their own duplicates. Doppelgangers are occasionally recognized because they cast no shadows. But let's talk about a doppelganger almost no one knows about. Let's talk about Roger Rabbit's doppelganger. Yeah, you heard me right. 
Remember the 1988 movie Who Framed Roger Rabbit about a hard-boiled detective in 1940s Hollywood trying to prove that cartoon star Roger Rabbit is innocent of the murder of Marvin Acme? The one that was famous for the way it melded live-action actors and cartoon characters so seamlessly that Bob Hoskins was allegedly institutionalized for a month after filming ended to help him stop talking to people that weren't there? Well, before it was a movie, it was actually a book. The book, Who Censored Roger Rabbit, involved Eddie Valiant trying to solve the mystery of who murdered comic strip star Roger Rabbit teaming up with his widow, Jessica, former co-star Baby Herman, and also Roger Rabbit himself. See, in the book, which incidentally took place before the invention of animated cartoons and was therefore about comic strip models and had cameos by Dick Tracy and Beetle Bailey, in this book, the tunes could generate doppelgangers of themselves short-lived, ghostly phantoms that looked just like them and could perform dangerous stunt work. Roger was very good at making a doppelganger, and his lasted for several days after he died. No joke. This was a major plot point in the book, and it was never really explained. But if Roger Rabbit isn't your thing because you were a zygote when that movie came out and thus you're making me feel old, let's talk about a more modern ganger. How about a Gengar? That's right. I've hit rock bottom. I'm referencing Pokemon. Note the accent. So Gengar is a ghost-type Pokemon which basically looks like a shadowy, vaguely humanoid cartoon thing. If you aren't familiar with Pokemon, it is a giant, all-consuming franchise encompassing multiple video games, animated series, movies, comic books, a trading card game, lunchboxes, toys, and pretty much every other stupid, pointless thing you might sell to a child. In the Pokeverse, a word I swore I would never say, children travel the world capturing strange creatures called Pokemon and forcing them to fight in vicious battles for their own entertainment. Obviously, since it's basically fantasy cockfighting for children, people got very upset about how the series sometimes mentions the word evolution misusing the word so badly that Charles Darwin's ghostly form is going to rise from the dead someday and beat series creator Satoshi Taijiri unconscious with a copy of On the Origin of Species by means of natural selection or the preservation of favored species in the struggle for life. Yes, that is the full title. I kid you not. Speaking of ghosts named Gengar and vengeful spirits rising from the grave, it's actually interesting to note that Gengar might not be named after the doppelganger after all. Despite the fact that he likes to imitate people's shadows and follow them around. In fact, Gengar is probably a reference to the Genganger What's a Genganger? Well, it's actually a Norse spirit, which we might call a revenant. The Genganger was a restless spirit that rose from its grave for some reason and took on bodily form. The Vikings called them Draugr, which you might recognize if you played Bethesda's massive productivity black hole, Skyrim. There are lots of legends about the Genganger and the Draugr, which, by the way, were mortal and physical 
and could be killed with swords, because in Viking stories, everything worth talking about could be killed with swords. Lots of superstitious rites existed about how to keep the dead dead. But what's more interesting about the Genganger is how they came about. It was said that Gengangers were spirits that could not find rest in the afterlife because of the way they died. Murder victims couldn't sleep peacefully, nor could those who committed suicide. But more interestingly, neither could those who were guilty of murder. And that brings us around to how you can use Doppelganger and Genganger and Revenants and other such things in your D&D game. In an interesting way, I mean. The doppelganger tries to replace one of the heroes thing has been done to death, right? As has the oh no, the king is really a doppelganger plot. You've got to mix this stuff up a bit. For example, once upon a time, the party in my campaign befriended someone who became an ally and romantic interest, and then, by accident, she got killed, and the party discovered she had been a doppelganger. Some time later, they discovered the original person was not dead because they rescued her from an enemy stronghold. But it turned out, she had been replaced before she met the party. So the original real person was less real to them than her doppelganger. And they never found out what the doppelganger had been up to. I'm just saying, if you want to pull off a doppelganger, you have to work at it. Likewise, the whole spirit trying to solve its own murder thing like Roger Rabbit and the Genganger is neat, but also overdone. I'm actually more interested in the ghost of the murderer who can't rest. Imagine a plotline where a ghost lies to convince the party to help him find the ghost of someone else lost in the world. In the end, they discover the ghost is a murderer, hunting his own victim's ghost, trying to make amends so that both can move on to the afterlife. That's a twist. This has been the GM Word of the Week. It's written by the Angry GM and produced and recorded by me, Fiddleback. You can find more at madadventures.com and theangrygm.com.